Lord God, our Father, <laughs> what amazing, what an amazing thing it is to refer, to address the creator of the ends of the earth as Father. O oh Lord, help us be our proper size in your presence. Forgive us when we get so big. It's good to be little, Father. And in the name of, of your Son, Jesus, who is above all and who holds all things together by the power of his word, we marvel that we can be in your presence at all. You have given us a new address, Father. It doesn't have a postcode, but the ancients called it the Holy of Holies. And that's our address. And even more astonishingly, we are your address. You whom all the world cannot contain, dwell in us by the Spirit in all your fullness. And we marvel at all of this because Jesus gave every eight pints of his blood to save us. Thank you, Father, that we are a, a rescued people. So in his precious name, bless our time together this morning and just enable us to enjoy focusing on your Son. But may it be possible, Father, by the Holy Spirit's power, because flesh and blood can't rise to these things. Just do what you do in your way, by your power. In Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> you know, it's funny how, have you ever noticed that the Lord has a way of uh, turning you into what you think is a siding, which is actually the main road, because it was you, you that were on the siding, okay? And the Lord just suddenly comes and, and says, no, that's not the way. What we often think is plan B was God's plan A all along. Have you noticed that? Well, in a sense, I'm on what feels like plan B to me just now, but I'm trusting that it's God's plan A. I'm sorry if some of you need an interpreter this morning, okay, uh, but uh, I'll do my best to be intelligible. Um, Sword Magazine, let me just, quick advert, and this is just to say, in case there's any misunderstanding about it, all the Sword Magazines that are on the table are free, okay? I put it in your diary that a Scotsman gave you something for nothing, okay? <coughs> and uh, <coughs> just... Just want to, to, to say to you, look, this, this magazine is, is not only free to give away at this conference, but we do need subscribers urgently. We urgently need subscribers. It costs a very great deal of money to publish anything in paper today. And while we could get out of our problems for our own sake by going on to a digital edition, that wouldn't bless the many loyal readers we've still got who wouldn't know one end of a computer from another. So a digital edition would be no use to them, and they need this, but we can't keep publishing unless we get more subscribers. So please bear that in mind. And also, funnily enough, <coughs> on the inside front cover, you'll find a, a little paragraph down here on the bottom right, just in there. Freely give, it says. And basically, we're committed to putting this into the hands of anyone who wants it, whether they can afford the subscription or not, okay? So if you know somebody who needs this magazine because it exists primarily just to build up the body of Christ, just to restore the confidence of God's people in the Word of God. And so if you know somebody who needs a subscription but couldn't afford it, give us their name and address, fill out a subscription form, and we'll send them one free of charge. Okay? So thank you for that. End of the adverts. Let's turn to the, to the book of Acts. Okay, <coughs> we're in chapter 3. I'm, I'm going to read a big chunk just really so that we can get the flavor of what's happening here, okay? Acts chapter 3. 
<clears throat> okay, I'm going to read chapter 3 and most of chapter 4. <laughs> okay, so, so bear with me and pray that my, my tonsils hold out. Okay. Father, bless your word to us. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, and a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the Beautiful Gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms, and Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. Uh, but Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who had sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While he clung to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people, Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the Holy and Righteous One and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your rulers, but what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. Moses said, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him in whatever he tells you. And it shall be that every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. And all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and those who came after him also proclaimed these days, you are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, And in you all offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family, and when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, By what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, If we are being examined today concerning 
a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them with abject apology and promised never to do it again. And Peter answered, said, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people, for they were all praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. May God be praised for his word that is always fresh. Amen. Okay, now I'm going to put this aside just to give myself some room here. And uh, trust that I can get this technology to serve me. <coughs> okay. I wonder, <coughs> you know, when, when Steve was explaining to us about the whole matter of water this morning and, and we, we were dabbling in H2O, uh, <coughs> and then we, we looked through the blood and the bread and we actually began to focus on a little issue that most of us have probably never thought much about, and that's the issue of circumcision. I suppose most of us tend to think either of it as just a Jewish ritual, a rite of passage, as it were, or we perhaps think of it as the equivalent of infant baptism in, in churches. Well, I'm not going to cross swords with you on that one today, but I would have to say to you that you really need to think that one through with a bit more help from the scriptures, okay? I say that as respectfully as I can because I, I was a, a minister in, in a church in, in Scotland for a number of years and I, 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 a lot of infants came before me and I sprinkled them with water, uh, but they weren't baptized. Their parents' hearts were baptized in many cases. In some cases, baby was just being done because granny needed it done. Okay, but we're not going to go down that road. That's a diversion for now. But what's not a diversion is the whole issue of circumcision. What really is going on in circumcision? Is it just a rite of passage? Is it just a little religious ritual? Or is there more to it than that? Well, I want to suggest to you that circumcision speaks right into the very heart of what salvation is about. And it speaks into the heart of the passage that we just read in which you can see the omnipotence of man. Now, can't you? In that passage we just read, don't we see how utterly mighty human beings are and the wonderful things that we can accomplish? It Doesn't it stand out so well from the passage? Yeah? Yeah? The reality is that what we see is men looking stupid. 
we, we see religious men looking stupid. Religious men who say, now, we can't deny that this is a miracle, but let's stop it from spreading. Hello? No, the fact of the matter is, folks, that we've just read a passage that exposes the sheer idiocy, the sheer sadness, the sheer despicable barrenness of religion compared to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Religion and Christianity are not and never will be the same thing. And the little ritual of circumcision was given by God to prove an immense point. And we see it come into stark relief in earlier parts of Israel's history. We know that Abraham was commanded to circumcise his, his, his son Isaac on the eighth day. Ishmael was uh, was uh, circumcised that day. The whole household was circumcised that day. But if you want to really see what's happening with circumcision, you need to look at two other incidents. You need to look at one in, in, in Genesis where you find that, uh, <coughs> well, there was a, a sordid instrument, a, a, a incident where, uh, where Jacob's only daughter, Dinah, went out into the land to meet the Shechemites, she thought. She fancied a bit of social networking. And out she went, and she got on the wrong side of the prince of Shechem, who raped her. Now, he had kind of taken a fancy to the girl, and instead of just abandoning her, he went to Jacob and, and the sons of Jacob and, and thought that he could perhaps come to some arrangement whereby he could marry uh, Dinah, and she would become effectively a princess of the Shechemites. Jacob's sons dealt deceitfully with the Shechemites because they were appalled and horrified at what had been done. It was a despicable thing to the Israelites, to Jacob's people anyway at that time. And they made a deceitful pact with the Shechemites and said, well, the only way that our families can be conjoined is if you agree to circumcision so that you're like us. So the men of Shechem thought, well, okay, this is a small price to pay because these are wealthy people and their wealth is going to come into our family line and it's a win-win situation. So let's get circumcised. So all the men were circumcised and when the men, we are told, were still in pain, two of Jacob's sons rose up, took their swords and put to death every male in Shechem. Now, what's the point of that? The point is that the men of Shechem were unable to fight. Why? Because they had a sign in their foreskin of their absolute and abject powerlessness. They couldn't do anything to defend themselves. There's another incident a bit later in Israel's history in the time of Joshua where they've just crossed the River Jordan, as you do, you know, with walls of water on either side, it's a favorite way to, to cross a river, isn't it, really? And <laughs> so they had crossed the Jordan, and the whole of Israel had gone across into this, this alien land that they had been told they were to conquer. They were going across as an invading nation. They were going into hostile territory. So God gets them safely across the river. They put markers in the river to remind themselves as a sort of memorial forever of this amazing event that took place. And no sooner have the waters come together again and they're safely delivered into Canaan, then God comes to Joshua and says, now I want every male to be circumcised. And you can hear Joshua thinking, Lord, the other side of the river would have been a good time to do this. You know, are you talk like, talking, Lord, about disabling your entire army? Uh, those are Canaanites on the walls over there, Lord. They're watching us. Uh, I really, honestly, Lord, could you open the waters again? Could you just send us back over Jordan, please? Uh, and, and let us go over there and then close the waters and then we'll all be circumcised. It'll be much better, surely, Lord. It was the purpose of God that his invading people should be completely disabled in the land of hostility. 
That's what circumcision is really talking about. It's talking about our total and utter dependence on the living God. It's not just a little religious symbol about belonging to the family of God. It's a, it's a symbol that signifies our absolute abject weakness. And look at these men here who performed this notable miracle. That's not my description. That's, that's their enemy's description. It was a notable miracle. This man was 40 years old, had, had been crippled all that time, and in the name of Jesus, he was given a new life. But how was he given a new life? He was given a new life by men who had no power of their own. None at all. Nothing they could bring to the, to the whole need of the man. They could look at, into his eyes and he could look into their eyes and they could say, well, we've got no silver to give you, no gold to give you. We can't, no doubt lots of other people have passed you today and they've tossed something into your collecting cup and yeah, but we can't do any of that for you. We can't do for you what those guys did. But we can give you something else. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. This is our Jesus. He's alive. I want to read you something just for a moment or two. You'll not find this in sword until you get the next edition. So this is a trailer, okay? <clears throat> On the front cover of the next edition, we've just put the empty tomb. He is not here. Your life, if you're trusting Jesus as your Lord and Savior today, this is how you can be described. And if you're not trusting Jesus as your Lord and Savior, this is how you could be described if you did. Okay? Your life is a miracle. When you woke this morning, you said a quick thank you to your closest friend who died 2,000 years ago. Perhaps you didn't sleep too well last night. Or perhaps you don't feel so good right now. Perhaps the days have been hard going lately. But guess what? As you're getting dressed or you're setting out breakfast, you talk about it to your oldest friend, your closest friend, who died 2,000 years ago. And later on, you reflectively leaf through his book and his wisdom lifts your flagging spirit. So solid, so consistent, so reliable, so tried, tested. And as his light bathes your mind, worry looks stupid. Discontent reeks of hell. Sickness and even suffering become purposeful. And enemies, they become lovable. He had a virgin birth. You have had a complete rebirth. He died once so that you would not die twice. He became the firstborn from the dead so that you could be born again. He bore your sin so that you might today bear his righteousness. He experienced orphanhood so that you might be adopted by God. He ascended into heaven to prepare a place for you. He is Lord of creation. You are a completely new creation. He learned obedience so that you might unlearn rebellion. When you first believed, you were given a new address and a new destiny. What the ancients called the Holy of Holies is now your dwelling place, whatever your earthly postcode might be. And Jesus, 
He has dual citizenship. He lives invincibly in heaven and also in you. You did not become a Christian by being born in Britain or by having Christian parents or by being sprinkled with water as a baby. You did not even become a Christian by making a statement of faith. You did not choose him. He chose you. If you are a true Christian, you are his workmanship. You are not self-made. You are marked out by gratitude, not worn out trying to win his gratitude. You have no need of what men call religion or ritual because you have relationship. Oh yes, with your closest friend who died 2,000 years ago. Is there a hallelujah in the room? Huh? I should never encourage Malcolm. Bless you, brother. <laughs> Can always rely on Malcolm to get that contribution in there. No, I'm truly sorry. I really am for those people whose, who, the, the founders of whose religions are long dead. Their founders can't be their companions. They can't be their closest friend. They can't give them wisdom or counsel for any situation. And they cannot help to prepare them for the inevitability that one day the breath will leave their bodies. Because those founders themselves are dead. But our, our Lord has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Hallelujah! This is Jesus. This is who we serve. This is the one the apostles preached. Do you know that an apostle was def defined by one thing and one thing only? He was defined by being a witness to the resurrection. That was how they, they wrote the job description for a replacement for Judas. They said, since the day that Jesus went in and out among us, We, we need to have the people, people who were with us during all that time, people who actually kept company with Jesus, and people above all, it must be someone who witnessed the resurrection, someone who can be with us a witness to the resurrection. That's an apostle. And my, my friends, my brothers and sisters, if we are part of a true apostolic succession, it has absolutely nothing to do with whatever denomination we belong to. It has to do with whether or not we are a church, an apostolic church that bears witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the message. That's our gospel. That's what we are here to deliver to a lost world. And it will hate us for it. We need to come to terms, my brothers and sisters, with the fact that Jesus said, that we are to expect persecution. When I first started out in ministry back in the 1980s, I was as clueless then as I am now. And <laughs> I remember asking the Lord, saying, Father, I, what am I to do here? What, what, is the th what am I trying to do? What, what does it mean to be a minister today of the gospel? And the answer I got back was, prepare my people for persecution. In 1982? Who could have guessed way back in 1982 that God's people might be facing imminent persecution? But it's here. It's here. We have a Christian magistrate with 30 years flawless service to the community who has been sent away for diversity training because he doesn't tick the politically correct boxes and agree that it's okay to send a child who needs adoption to a same-sex couple. This is, this is where we're living. So let's go back into the 
into Acts. And let's see what we might still find here. I'm watching the time. I'll s I promise I'll stop for breakfast, okay? Now, <coughs> Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Jesus the Messiah from Nazareth. Rise up and walk. Peter, <laughs> this was the same man, of course, who denied Jesus, wasn't it? Or was it? He was a very, very different man, wasn't he? Huh? On the day of Pentecost, he stood up and he said to the crowd, you have crucified the Son of God. And you knew who he was. You know, our, our brother Chris pointed out earlier on, and I was glad that, that Chris said it, that there is a tendency these days to, to misstate the gospel. The gospel, the first statement of the gospel is not Jesus loves you. The first statement of the gospel is you don't love Jesus. You're on the wrong side of God. Please, I challenge you. Go into the New Testament. Look at the apostolic preaching and look at how they first opened their mouths to speak to the community. They didn't talk about the love of God. They talked about the need for repentance. They didn't do so in a condemning way. And Peter said to the people here, he said, I know, brothers, that you acted in ignorance, as did your rulers. <laughs> I like that one, don't you? Your rulers are ignorant. Your religious leaders are ignorant. Brothers and sisters, we're not in a place to be standing condemning everybody around us who, who disagrees with, with our position in the gospel. But neither are we called of God to be mealy-mouthed in a situation and in a religious society that is ignorant. I believe the day has come when we're actually going to have to speak out in, in response to some of the farcical things that, that religious leaders are saying these days and say, sorry, that is ignorant. That is not based on the Word of God. Now, we're not going out of our way to pick a fight with anyone. We believe profoundly that we are to love our enemies, but hey, hold on. Have you considered that if we weren't supposed to have any enemies, Jesus wouldn't have told us to love them. And one of the things that is so sad about much of today's church is it wants to be nicer than Jesus. It doesn't want to have any enemies. We want to be the good guys that are in everybody's good books. And, you know, and we publish little, little, little leaflets that go out right about Christmas and Easter and, and we tell people what a wonderful bunch of people we are you know, we, we have this praise band to die for. We've got a coffee bar in the corner. It's comfortable. It's got lovely chairs. And we've got a creche for the kids and activities for the older teenagers. And Yeah, and we fully understand if you're, the, if you're the parent of a teenager, we understand why some animals eat their young. You know? <laughs> but, but the fact of the matter is... <laughs> The fact of the matter is that if you read those leaflets, you'll very often find that they're doing the exact, exact opposite of what Paul of Tarsus said. He said, I quote, We preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for his sake. We preach not ourselves. And many of these leaflets that are going out today to encourage the community to come into us are preaching ourselves. We're preaching the saved instead of the Savior. We're saying, come and look at us. Come and see what nice people we are. Come and join us. We're not going to make you feel uncomfortable. Hey, hold on. This church, the church of the first century, made lots of people feel uncomfortable. A great many priests joined them, but nevertheless, many dared not join them. 
you could never be neutral about this particular church in the first century. You either wanted to be part of it or you gave it a wide berth. There was nothing in between. You couldn't be neutral. Why? Because of the presence of Jesus among his people. Jesus, the word made flesh, is the plumb line. He's a dividing line. And people make up their minds about Jesus and therefore make up their minds about the church. Now, folks, I don't know quite where this leaves you and me. I don't quite know where it leaves us because maybe, maybe to this week we can help each other get the answer to the question. Because, you see, if, if we here now, if we were a church, if we were a local fellowship, there is every likelihood that God in his mercy has put us on the same page, given us a measure of agreement that is so special, so wonderful, that when it comes to the end of this week, we're not going to want to part company. We're not going to want to go our separate ways because we've enjoyed this agreement. But we've got to take this, the, the principle that we've agreed about. We've got to take this light that God has shared into our hearts and we've then got to take it back to extremely discouraging and frustrating circumstances that we're, in a sense, glad to be out of for a week. Hello? <laughs> Isn't that the case? <laughs> Agnes and I went through a period a number of years ago where we didn't go to church for two years. In fact, there was one time when I was a minister, I said to my church, if I wasn't your minister, I wouldn't come to church. It maybe wasn't the most gracious thing I've ever said, but oh, I meant it. I meant it. But you see, the thing is, here we are, many of us are in discouraging situations. We're, we're, we're going back into, in, into a context that is hard going. So what do we do with what God is showing us right now? Clearly, you know, Chris and I are 100% clear that the focus on Jesus at this conference is, is, is exactly right. So if the focus is supposed to be on Jesus, that clearly has to be the focus for you and me as we leave this place on Friday. And we're going to have to ask our Heavenly Father to show us how the rubber meets the road. What does it mean in practical terms to go back into our discouraging situations with our eyes fixed on Jesus. Let's move on a wee bit. Peter said in explanation to the people, why do you wonder about this as though by our own power we had made this man walk? And he said, listen to this, he said, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers. Peter's just simply saying to all these Jewish people, this is your God at work. This is not strange. Don't behave as though it's strange. This is what you can expect of your God. This is what you could always expect of your God. He hasn't changed. What does it mean that we are seeing God at work in the name of His Son? He sent this, this precious son of his, with his deliberate plan and foreknowledge that Jesus' own lifeblood was going to be poured out for a bunch of ingrates. And that's you and me, really. We're learning to be grateful now, but we're not always grateful, are we? What's the proof of that? That by tomorrow morning, you'll have moaned about something. Eh? We're not always grateful, but he's always faithful. And he who began a good work in us will carry it on and complete it at the day of Christ Jesus. There is, as, as our brother rightly pointed out this morning, there is work for us to be, to be doing. This is not something where we passively sit and wait for God to clothe us with, with glory. There, there's a whole bunch of change that has got to come into us. And maybe that's the beginning of the answer that we need to take back with us that instead of going back and, th and looking at our, our context and saying, oh, woe is me, how discouraged I am by what I'm coming back into, 
We go and we look in the mirror and say, oh, woe is me. Look at who I am. Look at what I am. Look at, oh God, what you've still got to do in me. And if we are willing to let God begin the change at the personal level, I think we can trust him to do something about the corporate level. Amen? Okay. And just before I close, <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you this, because Adam's one minute reminded me of it, about the young chap who, uh, who went round the churches preaching as a student. And when he went to one country parish church, the, the beadle put a little whistling, whistling kettle on the, on, the, on the stove, and he was quite perturbed by this. And the beadle said, it's okay, you don't need to worry. I have heard that you're a very good preacher, but when some come here, I just half fill the kettle. But the fact of the matter is, brothers and sisters, the fact of the matter is that we're being challenged this week to dare to believe that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus has not changed. That's what Peter was saying. Our Lord has not changed. This man is made well because our God has not changed. Maybe you haven't heard from him since Malachi, but our God has not changed. Our God has not changed. Maybe we feel that we haven't heard from God personally in a long time, but our God has not changed. He has given you the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was given you when you first professed faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. That wonderful gift within you means that you, brother, sister, you can hear from God, and together we can hear God accurately. Let's pray. <clears throat> our Father, our amazing, wonderful, glorious Father, we ask in the precious name of Jesus that you will forgive us for reconstructing you in our own image. Forgive us for forgetting that you, the Lord, do not change. Help us in the, in the precious name of Jesus to accumulate again in our hearts this week a, a picture of our, of our Lord and his greatness, perhaps as we never grasped it before. Take us back and nourish us with more and more freshness, vitality from your hand. As Pastor John Robinson said, your word hath yet more light and truth to break forth from it. And we ask in Jesus' precious name that we would be much refreshed in your presence this week and that we would go home from here on Friday to live and work for your glory and to be for your glory, to be the image of Jesus, to bless your heart in his name. Amen. <laughs>